inviting me. Um, we've been um, thinking and worrying about climate change at Lloyd's um, right, basically since I joined. Um, I was given the, the task of thinking about the impacts of climate change on the Lloyd's market and the insurance industry um, in general and um, started off by um, convening a report called Adapt or Bust where we asked scientists to help us think through the many impacts and we sort of thought through the effective policies that we write and what the impact would be on assets and all the, all the aspects of an insurer. So I wanted to sort of take you through the evolving um, thought process that we've had over those years. Before I um, get into that detail, I'll just very briefly say, because it's relevant later, um, two things. One, how the Lloyds market works and also how... Um, we are capitalised to withstand extreme risk because that is relevant in the context of climate change in, when we ask ourselves, how is this going to change? How is it going to get How is it going to be worse? So basically, here we have the Lloyds building, which has sometimes been described as a factory for insurance. Um, I actually like the building. It's, it's, uh, if any of you have been to London, it's an interesting, interesting design, but uh, it, it's not liked by everyone. I think the Prince of Wales is not overly keen on it. Um, but basically, it's um, a marketplace of competing companies who have spaces in the room, the underwriting room, and the brokers um, bring the business into Lloyd's um, and place it a bit at a time with all the syndicates at Lloyd's until they've got 100% coverage, and then the risk is placed and it's stamped with a Lloyd's a Lloyd's uh, stamp that comes to Lloyd's policy. The capital, which is the money we hold in case the premium isn't enough, um, that comes from members, and there's a whole sort of different type of members. There's corporate members, there's individual names. Um, and that's sort of basically it in a nutshell. It's quite a complicated, unusual uh, place. And the key point is it's not a company, it's a marketplace for insurance. Um, so... What I want to explain here is, I'm sure everyone's familiar with a balance sheet. Um, an insurance balance sheet is, is no different to any others, and here it is nicely in balance. Uh, so you have on the one side your assets. These are the financial instruments that we invest in so that we've got the money to pay the claims um, when they arise. And they're, for Lloyd's, typically um, short-dated um, investments, treasury, uh, corporate bonds in, in highly rated organisations. A little bit of equities, but not very much. Um, if you're a life assurer, it would be different. You'd have a lot more um, higher, um, higher risk corporate bonds and some equities as well. So that's the assets. And these, I would claim, are going to get affected by climate change. Then you've got the other side of the balance sheet. You've got the liabilities. They're in two forms. One is um, premium reserves, which is the money that we hold um, for things that haven't happened yet. So we take in premiums for motor, household, etc. Um, until the accident's happened, um, we can't release that money. So we hold those reserves um, for the future. But we also have a second sort of reserve, which are claims reserves. And those are the things that have happened, um, but we don't know quite how much they're going to cost yet. Um, so the house has burned down, it's being adjusted. How much gets paid? What was the cost? So those are the two sorts of reserves. And then this final bit on top is the capital. Um, and this is particularly important <coughs> because insurance is all about trust. As you know, we, we sell a policy um, that we will pay you if, if bad things happen and you need to know that we're going to be there. And the capital is calculated these days using models. So we will simulate um, our profit and loss account over and over again, um, hundreds of thousands of times. And we will, in, when we do that, we will use things like catastrophe models to simulate simulate um, hurricanes, earthquakes, floods, etc., and also simulate um, other lines of business like aviation, marine, etc. We'll simulate the assets, um, we'll do things like market shocks, and all of that gets pushed together into a profit and loss number. Um, reassuringly, mostly, we make a profit, which is good, but then there's this tail, this long tail of losses, and we have to be able to survive the 1 in 200 loss. So that's the test, that's the, the new Solvency 2 test that's coming in, but it's also been in the UK actually since 2004. So we have had to survive an event on our balance sheet that would be with half a percent probability in a year. So that's how we're capitalised, and that's important because climate change will affect all those areas. So I'm just going to run through now um, the different types of policies that we sell and the different ways that climate change might affect them. So starting with this sort of in a sense, the obvious thing, which is the property damage. So we use catastrophe modelling, and the team that I run, that's one of the areas that it looks into. So we will have um, our 
uh, simulated properties on the ground and we will simulate hurricanes that will hit them or floods and we will say given the wind speed at that location how much does that property get damaged um, and that will be um, all fed together with all the other properties to give us a sense of the expected loss and the probable losses in the year. So we asked the well-known catastrophe modelling firms, so Equicat, RMS, JBA, AIR, to um, tell us whether climate change was affecting their models. Is it having an effect yet on their models? Um, and sort of a mixed response, which was interesting, and they all looked at different areas. So some of them looked at European storms, some of them looked at hurricanes in the US, um, we had flooding and so on and so on. So, forth. so you wouldn't expect a sort of uniform effect. They all said which I was pleased because it's the first time as far as I'm aware this has ever been said by those cat, cat modelling firms that any trends in the data that we have seen to date will be coming through in the models by default they use they tune their models using the data um, and as you get an increasing frequency or increasing severity so it will feed through into the models so definitely anything that's, that we've been seeing to date will be coming through in that sort of slow data series but not explicitly um, and, it, and I'm coming on to talk about hurricane, except for hurricane, which is being come, done explicitly. Um, then RMS in their study, um, and this is on noise.com study if anyone's interested, they said they were looking at the impact of sea level rise off the coast of Manhattan, and they said, with, with um, Superstorm Sandy, and they said that just the 20 centimetres of sea level rise um, that has happened since the 1950s led to a 30% increase in the surge losses. So a very large effect from a small amount of sea level rise. And we can definitely say that a large chunk of that sea level rise is due to climate change, due to thermal expansion of the oceans, due to meltwaters, etc. So there's no doubt, then, that there's been an effect, an insurance loss effect, due to climate change. Um, JBA looked at flooding and said over the last half century an increasing proportion of the UK's weather rain has fallen during intense um, wet spells. So they're starting to see, and then that means it is coming through in the data. So it's affecting UK flood. Uh, but hurricanes, and I'm going to talk about this on the next slide, very definite signal. According to Jim Elsner, who's a, a statistician in the US from a company called Climate Tech. And so what he's done is a very complicated <coughs> form of Regression, which is called a quantile regression, which is where you, you actually regress the sort of 25 median, uh, actually that's probably 25 and 75 and 90 and 95 or something, but you, you regress the, uh, the quantiles and it says every single quantile is showing an increasing trend. So you've got the wind speed um, going up and that means economic damages go up. As the wind speed goes up, the damage goes up. It's sort of obvious, actually, because, you know, Cat 5s do more damage than Cat 4s. But when you see it um, as explicitly in the data like this, you can start to build up a sort of reductionist scientific <coughs> argument for the impact of climate change on, on hurricane losses. Then they've looked at the impact of sea surface temperature um, on the limiting intensity. So this says, as the temperature of the sea surface goes up, so the, st the storms are actually getting stronger. And this is not a physical model, which would show that you'd expect that. This is a statistical model saying it's definitely happening. So you put those two pieces together, climate change makes the sea surface temperature go up, sea surface temperature makes the storms more powerful, more powerful storms, more insurance losses. So there's a very strong link between climate change and insurance losses from hurricanes. So that's an interesting one, and I do think his work is very, very much worth looking at. So in terms of flooding, um, you've got saturated ground, you've got 4% um, more moisture in the atmosphere. Every degree centigrade of extra heat allows um, more water to be held up in the atmosphere. That leads to stronger downpours. Um, it also may lead to changed winter storm tracks. Um, so... This is an interesting one. I was talking to um, Risk Management Solutions last week, that was one of the cat modelling firms, and they were saying to me that the 2013-14 winter, I, mean, I believe you had some big effects in Ireland actually uh, on the coast, you had some very large coastal effects, and um, this was a very active, very powerful winter storm, it just didn't happen to hit mainland Europe very much. Um, it's unclear whether that's... Part of, the, part of the effect of climate change, it might actually 
mean that they're steering and missing, and maybe that's a good thing, but it might also just be an anomaly, in which case what we have um, is some very large, powerful storms that are going to come and get us at some point. Um, And then storm surges, I've talked about higher sea levels, and also stronger winds. Then there's subsidence, um, a very interesting paper by Swiss Re there, where they're actually saying in some parts of Europe, subsidence claims are now the costliest natural hazard, which is kind of, uh, surprised me, I have to say. Um, This is obviously where the clay soil typically dries out in the summer, um, and then it causes the the land to shrink, and then the foundations are undermined and it it can cause cracking. And then heave, which is exactly the opposite in winter, where they fill up again and they sort of swell up like a sponge, and it breaks it in the other direction, and it's constantly going up and down. Um, So that was an interesting thing. So obviously we write these property policies. Wildfire is another example. Not so big on the insurance um, costs compared to things like hurricanes, but you can see there that um, US insured losses over two side-by-side decades went up by quite a factor, 7.9 billion in one decade, 1.7 billion in the previous decade. So there are more wildfires happening, um, partly due to human factors. We've looked into this land management schemes, that sort of thing. But there is a definite signal in there from the mid-80s onwards, um, and possibly linked to uh, drier climate, more droughts, and also more lightning, because climate change leads to more, more lightning. So we write property policies, but I guess the key thing to remind everyone of is that those policies are typically one year at a time. So we might do construction, which might last for, say, six, seven years, um, but apart from that, most of our policies are one year at a time. And so we can adapt ourselves as an industry to those inc- increasing trends. If the risk goes up, then the um, claims will go up. Obviously, the premiums would probably need to adjust, and the capital held need to go up as well. So on the, pro- on the property damage side, whilst we are seeing some impacts, it may not be, uh, it's something we can handle as an industry, um, but we have to be careful and we have to describe what the reputational impacts are because we, you know, we have to balance the books. Our premium has to be enough to cover the risk. If the risk goes up, <coughs> then it's not us making more profits. We just have to cover the risk with those premiums. Um, liability is a very interesting area. So um, we have done a number of reports in the past. This one, Litation and Business Transatlantic Trends, looks at the US... Um, sort of um, compensation culture and how it's been exported over the years around the world um, and starts asking whether this will this coupled with climate change will have an impact. Mm. So um, a very interesting paper from the Geneva Association, um, which is a think tank, I don't know if you've heard of them, but they're based in, funnily enough, in Geneva. Um, and uh, they, they kind of are on the board, are all the CEOs of major insurance companies around Europe. Um, I think it's worldwide, actually. Um, They came out with a very interesting paper, um, which I thought was quite significant that a body like that would come out with something like this. And they said the innovative application of liability theories and the inevitable carbon footprint of all industries threaten insurers with exposure to liability claims that will be pervasive and difficult to avoid through traditional exclusionary clauses. So we have exclusions on our policies that says pollution is not covered, what we call slow pollution. So we will do sudden and accidental, you know, an oil, an oil rig gets tipped over and it, its fuel is spilt over the ocean. If it's covered, we will pay. But slow pollution, where it's a natural, maybe a, a toxic chemical tank that's dripping into the ground, um, we've learnt our lesson there. We paid lots of money in the 80s in the US and that is not covered. And the question is, climate change should be considered a slow pollution, we would argue. They're saying, well, traditional exclusionary clauses may struggle to keep the tide of liability at bay. This is unclear. So, sort of obvious here, we sell different policies. We sell general liability policies where ordinary people blame (coughs) companies for things and sue them. And we'll pay out on those cases. So there was the Coma versus Murphy oil case um, earlier this uh, century where they argued that this uh, particular oil company's activities led to the potential for Hurricane Katrina. And they were trying to argue that Katrina was stronger because of climate change and therefore part of the damages they suffered should be paid by Murphy Oil. Um, at the time, defended successfully by Murphy Oil, so it didn't, it didn't um, lead to a claim. Directors and officers is another one where the shareholders might blame the managers if they acted in a way that was deemed to be negligent. 
Um, and the question is, of course, negligence is decided after the fact when society's attitudes might be different in the future than they are today. Um, professional indemnity, uh, we provide cover for, and this would be where people blame their advisors. So architects, actuaries, um, city planners, you should have thought about this. We knew about climate change. Why was the building not built stronger, better? Um, and it was your fault. That's the argument. And, of course, there would be some potential for paying out on claims there. So, so far, cases have been defended. Um, and as I mentioned, we would, we would hope to think that they're excluded, but we're looking at that very carefully. And then another area is political risks. We provide um, contracts for uh, political violence and political risk. So things like um, seizure of property, where there's a regime change and the government decide that they own all those assets now, then that would be covered. Um, contract frustration, again, where you can't complete on the terms of your contract because there's, say, a, um, an embargo on the country. Terrorism, war on land. So lots of covers are provided in against the risk of political um, shocks. So we would argue that climate change is leading to an increase in, in tensions globally due to um, water disputes, energy shortages, and possibly migrations and loss of land. So we've done um, several reports. We've done a report on water, and we've also done a report on climate change and security. Um, there it was very interesting to me... Um, sort of obvious, but the population has actually gone up by a factor of three in the last 60 years, which is a huge growth in population globally. And how have we managed to achieve this as a human race? And it's because of the green revolution. So um, higher yielding strains of crops um, that are saline resistant and sometimes um, disease resistant, um, much greater increase in the use of fertilisers, and a 300% increase in the use of irrigation. Um, and you can see there that, as it says, the irrigated land is only 15% of the area of the land, but it, it's actually 40% of the world's food that comes from irrigation. Um, it turns out that a lot of that irrigation is from fossil water, which is water that is in aquifers that don't refill. So they were, they were sealed off tens of thousands of years ago, and they are being drilled, and the water is extracted and used for irrigation. But once it's gone, it's gone. So that's a risk, I think, in terms of the kind of carrying capacity of the environment. And also fertiliser production uses natural gas. So there's a sort of a fossil fuel dependency here as well. If you look at food price indices, they've gone up. Um, they sort of were pretty steady for a, a, quite a couple of decades. And then there was 2008 and 2010. Some very large jumps up in food prices. Um, 10 was caused by the Russian heat wave, which has been linked to a blocking pattern and climate change, um, and it led, some people argue, to the Arab Spring, because Egypt um, was, and other countries were trying to keep the price of bread down and affordable for their populations, but the cost of the, the price rises were just so large they couldn't control it. Now, this is not a certain fact, of course, but it's some academics are arguing that they are linked, and we are looking at food security now as part of our work. So climate change, general consensus, the impact on food production will be negative, um, impacting on all areas of food security. Um, and we've done another thing, I just sort of throw this in, of how connected all this is, because we're, we're always looking at for the next asbestos. Asbestos hit our industry very hard in the 80s. Um, synthetic biology is, is genetic modification on steroids, basically, and it's where you can use computers to design DNA um, and actually create it in the lab and then insert it into things. There's, there's sort of a, a strong desire to <coughs> use synthetic biology to make seeds more heat, drought, disease tolerant, um, which is good and that's progress, but of course our concern would be how robust will these new seeds be? You know, that nature has a habit of evolving into very robust, um, tolerant situation and if you use untested, untried things, how... how um, risky will that be and might we end up with some liability coming out of that as well so we're looking at that we're looking at um, uh, bread basket failure um, as a scenario at Lloyd's and thinking through how will that ripple through the economy and how will it affect political risk in the world <coughs> another point about water um, is that people might start to use it as a strategic weapon and in our report we were saying that you know, building a dam could start being seen as an act of aggression um, and there's some key risks in various uh, river basins, Nile, Tigris, Indus, Mekong. 
But just looking at the Nile, for example, um, if you look at what the um, Egypt could support without the Nile, it might be about 6 million people. But their actual population is 80 million. And upstream of them, Ethiopia, um, in 1950 had a population of 18 million. Now we're up to 80 million and is projected to 2050 years up to 180 million people. So rapid population growth there. And of course, that means that they will want to take the water at the source of the Nile and presumably deplete its downstream potential. So that's a potential conflict, the sort of thing that we're looking at here. Um, we know about population. Um, and the thing I would like to get across here is everyone talks about 9 billion by 2050, but we don't know that. That's, I mean, it could be, be 7.4, according to this study. It could be 10.6. So I think there's a lot of things that are taken as just, oh, that's the answer, it'll be 9. Well, it might not be 9, it might be 10.6, in which case the risks will be magnified and even worse. So that's a, we are keenly aware of uncertainties in all these projections. And then there's this idea of megatrend ref- refugees, um, which I won't go into detail. I think it's, it's fairly obvious. People moving across borders and increasing those tensions. So on marine risks, um, we write a lot of shipping um, insurance around the world. um, And how would climate change affect that? I mean, ships are supposed to go on the water. There'll be more water, but that'll be okay for them. So how could it affect them? Well, what we're thinking here is that we know that the Arctic and the sea ice is being lost at a rapid rate in the Arctic. Um, This is showing the graph showing the area lost um, over time. And you can see it's sort of slowly diminishing. And we reckon that that sea ice will be all but gone, possibly by 2030 or a bit later in the century. This will open up shipping routes that haven't really been available to um, normal transits, um, to humanity. That it'll be, it'll be, it'll radically change some of the routes and, and trade, which of course could make it more efficient, maybe even fuel efficient, which would be a good thing. But what could the risk be? Well, we've looked at this in our Arctic opening report. Um, basically, the Arctic is a difficult and dangerous place to do business in. Um, you don't have the infrastructure there. If you do have um, things like the usual boating accidents that you would see all around the world, it'll be much more difficult to um, remove the wreck, to handle the damage, to rescue the people. And also, the environmental clear-up will be much more difficult, as we saw with the Exxon Valdez, which Lloyd's paid a huge amount of money on in the early 90s. So, um, for example, oil, which will be degraded by bacteria um, in the Gulf of Mexico very quickly, so after Deepwater Horizon, the bacteria got to work on those oil slicks and started cleaning them up. I'm still plenty around, of course, sadly, but um, very quickly it it will be got rid of, whereas in the Arctic, oil can hang around for decades, causing more and more environmental harm. And then from an underwriting point of view, the question will be, is... This lo- is this risk, therefore, the same marine risk as we would have for normal shipping routes? And we would argue, no, the risk is higher. Um, OK, what about investments? So this, I'm not trying to claim that 9-11 had anything to do with, with climate change, but what it does show is how um, large political effects can have very big effects on markets. Um, I guess a fairly obvious point. So you had, you had 9-11 at sort of more or less the top of of the investment bubble, and then you had a rapid um, fall in the stock markets. I was at a life company at the time, and um, you know we, we saw the market go from sort of six and a half thousand, nearly seven thousand, um, the FTSE, right down to about three thousand, and that led, had a very big effect on insurance companies, particularly life companies. Um, they had a lot of investments in equities at the time, and their balance sheets were severely stressed, severely tested. Um, so. The point of this really is just to say the sorts of political stresses I was talking about earlier can have economic impacts and they will have impacts on the investment side of that portfolio as well. Um, And then the other area we're looking at is, which I believe you've had a talk on recently, so I won't spend too long on, but stranded assets. So this idea that um, to keep within two degrees you can only really spend about 565 to 800 gigatons of carbon um, and yet, um, the reserves on company balance sheets are around about 3,000 gigatons. So, multiples, multiples on the oil company balance sheets than, than can actually be spent if we want to keep to two degrees target. And what I suspect might happen with the increasing um, understanding of climate change, for example, you were talking earlier about the 
um, the agreement between the US and China, as people become more and more accepting of climate change, um, at some stage people will realise, I suspect, that we can't burn all this carbon, and that must, I would imagine, have an effect on the on the balance sheets of those companies. So if you're investing in those companies, you could see a significant write down of value. I believe that's what was said to you before. So we're thinking about that in terms of um, our own investments, but also back to those liability calculations. You know, if there's large amounts of value taken off stocks, who's going to be suing who and who's going to be blaming who? So, just to sum up so far, we've got our nice balance sheet in balance at the moment, but we're saying that the, um, the uh, physical damage will affect our liabilities, it will affect the premiums we charge, so we'd have to hold more premium reserves, it'll affect the capital we'd need to hold because events will be larger and we have to prepare for those larger events, so the capital needs to go up. And just at the time when you're really having to increase your assets, our asset values potentially could be going down because of the investment impacts that I was describing earlier. So, of course, it won't become out of balance because that would be an insolvent insurer, uh, but what it would need to happen is you would actually need to invest more on the asset side to counteract that, that there. Okay, so um, how much longer... I should carry rattle on, I think. Um. Yeah, I mean, maybe three or four minutes. Three or four minutes? Yeah. Okay, so just to say, we haven't been sort of taking this all on board and not doing anything. We've actually been taking action. So um, one of the things we did, along with a number of other companies, um, and in fact the Prince of Wales, was to start something called ClimateWise in 2007. And this is a collaboration between many insurers, um, now sort of global collaboration. Um, ClimateWise has a set of six principles at its heart, which says insurers can be part of the action against climate change. So we've got share our risk analysis with people, um, work with policy makers, so the governments around the world, um, tell our customers about the risks and try and explain them to people, um, think about our investments and what we can do about it, think about our own staff and carbon footprints. And then finally there's a governance piece which says this is an important board level topic so somebody at the board has to be responsible for it, which we, which we have, and that's actually my boss, Tom Bolt. Um, ClimateWise has done things like sustainable claims management, so we're trying to say if you had uh, new for old policies and repair rather than replace, we can be more sustainable um, in, our, in our own footprint. Um, we've also done things at Lloyd's. We did a paper uh, managing the escalating risks of natural catastrophes in the United States where we were trying to sort of softly lobby the government over there and say that, um, I mean, it's a bit self-serving inevitably, but we're saying that um, government intervention in private insurance markets should be kept to a minimum because when governments intervene, there's a danger that the true risk price isn't conveyed to the public and that can lead to um, sort of the sort of behaviours that actually encourage people to, to take risk rather than to protect themselves. Um, risk-based pricing is fairest eventually, um, although you may need to protect um, poorer communities in the interim. And the government does have an important role to play in publishing things <coughs> like maps, flood maps and that sort of thing, but also in terms of design of buildings and where to build. And then the Geneva Association that I mentioned earlier um, today have recently ratified a Kyoto statement that they made um, back in about 2008. And this was signed by about 80 of the CEOs of the largest insurance companies around the world, um, similar to climate wise it makes a number of statements you know, we're committed to enhancing our research promote mitigation efforts etc so we've tried to be on the front foot as an industry and tried to say you know, that we will play our part but we also need to think about protecting our own balance sheets and we've done work on um, valuing adaptation so you can use our modelling capabilities to say if the sea level does rise or the winds get faster or whatever and if you adapt your properties in certain ways, how much um, can you reduce the risk? So this says if you've got 100 of current risk, and then the sea level rises by 30 centimetres more, this coastal property, the risk goes up to 186% of its current levels on an annual <coughs> loss basis. But actually, if you just put, and this is probably a bit easier for um, new build than existing properties, but if you put, build them on 50 centimetres stilts, 
you could actually, which they do in the Caribbean, you could reduce the risk down to below current levels. So appropriate building and adaptation can actually protect, at least in the short term, against the rising costs of climate change. And then finally, in the longer term, um, I'd like to say that we can take an insurance approach to thinking about climate risks. So there's all this debate about whether we should spend now to protect future generations. And people do cost-benefit analyses, which in my view are largely quite flawed, because they aren't thinking about... And they aren't thinking about future generations, and they aren't thinking about the utility of the society. They're often just thinking about in pure money terms, discounted money, which is, I think, a flawed approach. What this shows um, from the IPCC report is how, on the representative contribution pathway, we're heading for four degrees um, by the end of the century, which is a, a, a horrible prospect globally, um, and there will be some very largely affected countries around the world. But this work by um, a, a group called climateprediction.net, um, which I know some people there, they've actually looked at sort of um, the uncertainty in all the parameters in climate models, the things we don't know, and said, well, supposing we sort of sample from that uncertainty, how big really is the width of the temperature rise? And actually it goes, I mean, it goes frighteningly up to even 10 degrees. Now, okay, that's not very likely, but the point is you can't rule it out because there's a lot of uncertainty. And if you think like that, you say, well, what would you do with insurance? You buy insurance against the risk of your house burning down, the risk of a very large loss. It's not very likely, like this, but it's worth protecting against because it'd be so bad if it happened. And I sort of would argue that the same should be true with climate change. We should spend the money now on mitigation to keep within those carbon targets to avoid those risks in the long future. Okay, which I've just said there. So, in summary, one, we have to hold capital for extreme events, and climate change will affect that. Two, there are a number of foreseeable effects of various time periods, and I talked about property, liability, political risk, marine. So there's lots of areas of the policies we sell. Um, investments may be affected too, and consensus that we're seeing, um, US, China, etc., could, could lead to market shocks, suddenly revisions of value. This treble whammy on, bas- um, on the balance sheets, you've got your assets, liability and capital. Um, we've taken some action as an industry, um, climate-wise, Kyoto, etc. And we can use our expertise to help um, understand the value of adaptation. And finally, we should take an insurance approach to, look to avoiding these risks. Thank you very much.